This is a presentation on personal property tax legislation being given, given by our city attorney, Scott Smith. Do you want to do any in introductory remarks? Just a short lead in. Um, the personal property tax law has changed numerous times since last fall, and we believe that right now we're in the best position in regard to replacement revenue based on many of the changes that were enacted earlier this year. And our city attorney, Scott Smith, had the privilege of serving on an internal working group with the governor's office to do some of these changes in the legislation. So he's going to walk you through where we are with personal property tax and why it's important that proposal one on the August ballot pass um, from a city perspective. And he's doing this so that you're prepared for the resolution that we have presented for you later in the agenda. So with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. Thank you. Uh, if you'll remember in December of 2012, there was on December 13th kind of a mad dash to get the personal property tax exemptions passed. And about three or four o'clock that afternoon, it sounded as if the legislature was going to consider bills to pass personal property tax exemptions without any replacement revenue. The lieutenant governor stepped in and in cooperation with MML, the Michigan Association of Counties and others, that tide was turned, and <clears throat> later that day there was legislation enacted, actually late that night, that phased in the exemptions for eligible manufacturing personal property and for small taxpayers. Um, the legislature enacted bills providing for replacement revenues to local governments for non-essential services. Um, the, a state authority would replace the revenues from the use tax for essential services, every local government was going to have to levy an e a, a local essential services special assessment. And so that a business that was located, for instance, in a village would get a special assessment from the village, from the township, from the county, and perhaps a fire authority or, or an ambulance authority or both. There were some cases where there was a possibility of five different special assessments that a business was going to have to grant and those special assessments then had to deal with a community-wide cap in terms <coughs> of the, the amount that those ass assessments could be and a business-specific cap. And finally, it provided only 80% total reimbursement to local, local governments. Additional legislation was needed uh, beginning in 2013 because that 2012 legislation didn't deal with the process for granting the exemptions or for denying the exemptions, didn't address tax increment financing at all. There were concerns about the legality and procedure for the local essential services assessment. The timing of the state distributions, local assessments, and so forth wasn't addressed. So the lieutenant governor convened a broad group of about 40 people at the beginning of January of 2013 with the goal that all of the legislation would be enacted in the spring of 2013. It finally got done in the spring of 2014. Uh, the small taxpayer exemption applies where the total cash a true cash value of eligible personal property, all eligible personal property located within a tax collecting unit, either a city or a township, that is owned by, leased to, or in the possession of an owner or related entity on December 31, tax day of the preceding year, is less than $80,000. It looks at all personal property used by a business within the city. The owner pays the tax, the owner of the personal property pays the taxes, but eligibility is determined by possession or control. So if you had a party store, for example, and the party store had a cooler that was owned by Pepsi, a, um, a copy machine that was owned by Xerox, a cash register um, that they were leasing from somebody else, if the total value of all that personal property exceeded $80,000, none of it would be exempt even though the business owner may not pay any of that personal property tax. It requires filing an annual affidavit on February 10th. The qualified new and previously existing personal property exemptions begin in 2016, and we we'll, can talk about this in light of our tax abatement request later on the agenda. 
It applies to eligible manufacturing personal property initially placed in service after December 31, 2012, or to eligible manufacturing personal property that's um, been placed in service for at least 10 years. So by 2022, all manufacturing personal property should be exempt. Um, the laws were changed now to provide for record keeping, denials, appeals, fraudulent claim consequences, and so forth. And there is a process that the assessor can use to um, deny a claimed exemption and to put the property back on the roll. And there are consequences for taxpayers that fail to comply with the statute. The source of local replacement revenues, there's a local community stabilization share portion of the use tax if the ballot proposal is approved in August. It's levied by the local community stabilization authority and the local community stabilization share of the use tax has been calculated each year to provide a 100% replacement for local governments. Now, Interestingly, the law says money received and collected for the local community stabilization share is not state funds, shall not be credited to the state treasury, and shall be transmitted to the authority to be dispersed by the authority only as authorized under the act. The local community stabilization share is a local tax, not a state tax, and money received and collected for the local community stabilization share is money of the authority and not money of the state. The idea here is that they wanted to tie it up every way that could be tied up so it doesn't go through the annual appropriations process and the legislature can't touch any of this money. And that's about as tied up as it can be without a constitutional amendment. The administration of the local replacement monies, uh, there will be local reporting to the county equalization office and then the county will report to the department of treasury the treasury department will do most calculations for local governments tiff entities because there's not good data on tiff entities will have to do many of their own calculations distributions will be uh, made by the authority for July tax replacement generally on October 15 and for December tax replacement generally by February 15. So you'll get the replacement funds from the use tax roughly about the same time you would normally get your, your tax levy. Uh, distribution of local replacement revenues is a little bit complicated. Um, Unlike the previous information you gave us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, for fiscal years 13 and 14 and 14, 15, you, you get a, everybody gets 100% of debt loss replacement. So remember the only exemption that's in place is the small taxpayer exemption and to the extent you're relying on that to make debt payments, you get 100% reimbursement. For cities, they will get 100% reimbursement of the small taxpayer loss, but that's only going to be paid in 2016. Beginning in 2016, priority payments will be made to local governments. 100% of debt loss, 100% of essential services losses, and 100% of the small taxpayer loss. And for TIF entities, they'll get 100% of their losses. Beginning in fiscal year 2020, 5% of the remaining revenues um, are shared on a proportionate basis. So, It'll be proportionate to the amount of industrial personal property that Mount Pleasant has mm -hmm. as a proportion of all the industrial personal property in the state. And the idea here is that we want to encourage local governments to host industry. And the way to do that is to reward those that do and those that don't will get um, decreasing amounts of the use tax reimbursement. Okay, the state's going to need to replace some revenues. Once the use tax is shifted, if the ballot proposal is approved in August, then the state needs to replace some of those lost revenues. They're doing that from two sources, a phase out of tax credits, and there will now be a state essential services assessment. It's paid by only by those with exempt eligible manufacturing personal property, so it's paid only by industry. 
It's based on the acquisition cost of that personal property, so there won't be depreciation schedules and so forth for um, industry to use. There are three millage rates based on the years since acquisition. So if it's been one to five years since acquisition, it'll be 2.4 mils, five to, uh, or six to 10 years, 1.25 mils, and after it's been uh, acquired for more than 10 years, 0.9 mils. There's also adjustments available for existing tax abatements and exemptions, and the Michigan Strategic Fund can grant abatements and exemptions to the state essential services assessment, and those are only going to usually be granted to highly mobile industries. That it, those will be the big industries that could locate here or someplace else. Uh, there will be a single return and a single payment for all personal property in the state. So, benefits of the current plan. All, um, it exempts small taxpayers from paying personal property tax. Eventually, all eligible manufacturing personal property will be exempt. There's a simple exemption procedure. You simply file an affidavit. Um, it's not a lengthy application that needs to be filled out. The state essential services assessment will result in uh, at least an 80% reduction for most manufacturers. There's a single state return and a single payment. For local governments, it provides now 100%, not 80%, but 100% replacement revenues. It takes the administration of the tax out of the state's budget process with a set formula. Personal property tax administrative burden should be reduced as a result of this. I know a lot of uh, assessors I've talked to aren't convinced of that, but um, that's, that's part of the goal. And for everybody, there aren't any local essential services assessments as there were at the end of 2012. And I'll take any questions anybody has. Scott, one part I forgot to have you address is this, the benefits of this plan that you just went through are all if Proposal 1 passes. That's correct. What happens if Proposal 1 does not pass? If Proposal 1 doesn't pass, um, all of these bills are tie barred. So the exemptions go away and the replacement revenues go away. Um, we would still lose the tax that had been levied um, for 2014 uh, or, or the exemptions that we lost in 2014. And um, there are many who think that if the proposal does not pass, the legislature will, in lame duck, address the issue in another way, and it might be back to what happened or was going to happen in the late afternoon of December 13, 2012. That is, the legislature could um, enact the exemptions without any replacement revenues. Anybody doing any polling data, you know, where does this, or is it way too early for people to say whether this has a chance of passing or should, I know it should pass, but. Um. I, I, there hasn't been a lot of publicity on it other than people going out and speaking to various groups. Um, however, it's got a unique effort um, behind passage. So the Michigan Manufacturers Association together with the Michigan Municipal League and the Lieutenant Governor's Office have been working to um, try to uh, promote passage. And you've got all of the business associations, all of the government associations, and police and fire unions supporting passage. It's, it's in my experience, a unique circumstance where all three of those groups are coming together and supporting a, a set of um, legislative bills and a ballot proposal. I, I've never seen that. Commissioner. Um, I, I just want to make sure I understood a couple of things. Was I, am I hearing you say that on the, the part that's already exempt, the 80,000 and below, that, that's already been exempted, the, the communities will receive payment for that in 2016? The cities will. Right, and does for, that... For, for 2014 and 2015, cities okay. will. Beginning in 2016, everybody gets reimbursed 
Okay. For those two fiscal years, only cities get reimbursed. All right. So cities then w will actually be held harmless. In 2016, right. you'll get the payments for the previous right. years. Everybody else will be held harmless from 2016 going forward. Okay, good. Thank you. That's what I thought. I just want to make sure that I had understood well, I, that. I also want to make sure I'm clear. So, yeah. if And then, again, I, I think I understand why the assessors aren't all that convinced it's going to be less work. Uh, will assessors still have to determine the value of personal property? Ta the personal property acquisitions within a community? I mean, is that how the state's going to determine um, how much money you get? If you, if you get a proportion of the money based on how much personal property you have and that changes from year to year, for, does that? For, well, for industry, for eligible manufacturing personal property, assessors are going to have to accept the affidavits and, and that's about it, okay? okay? And, and so for eligible manufacturing personal property, it should drastically reduce their burden. Okay. The benefit of that is if you've ever had assessment appeals on manufacturing personal property, some of those are very complicated and very expensive appeals to fight. You know, I've had some for paper mills, for uh, generating facilities and so forth, and, and you pay lots of dollars for appraisals and they're very technical kinds of things. For the small taxpayer exemption, assessors are going to have to deal with the affidavits on an annual basis because, as you can imagine, for small taxpayers, the value of the personal property they have can go up or down in any given year. And um, at least this year, I talked with many assessors who said, geez, an amazing thing happened. We got affidavits from all kinds of businesses that had never before filed a personal property tax return. Mm -hmm. So for at least this year, a number of assessors have reported an increase in work, and I see Dave is here. He can mm -hmm. probably address that, but he and I have talked about it a little bit, and he's had an experience similar to, to many others. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the most important question is in terms of the resolution that we have tonight. So at one point, I heard you saying that um, they will take into consideration existing abatements. So I wondered what that meant. And that if it meant anything, then if we passed this abatement tonight versus just letting it go and allowing the tax to go away when assuming the proposal one passed. Well, um, there were abatements in existence at the end of 2012 when the personal property tax reform was first enacted. And for those, they wanted to make sure that adjustments were made for communities who were then depending on, for a continuing period of time, the payment of the 50% industrial facilities tax. Mm -hmm. Okay? For those issued after December 31, 2012, there's no longer that concern because every community issuing an abatement is going in with eyes wide open. What I'm suggesting that communities do is uh, if you're approving an abatement for, for industrial personal property, approve the abatement to expire at the end of 2015 when the new exemptions take place beginning in 2016 so that you don't have any overlap and confusion. And, and for the yeah. business, it won't make any difference. Mm -hmm. so, so that if we pass this tonight, the, the, the local company would get a 50% abatement, and then starting in 2016, they will, they'll have a 100%. Right, because okay. the personal property is being acquired after December 31, 2012. So beginning January 1 of 2016, it would be 100% exempt. Thank you very much. Okay. I just wanted to indicate that we have some adjusted wording to address Commissioner Ling's comment or question. We so do. And um, I can, I don't, didn't bring that up, but I, I'll read it when we get to that agenda item. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Well, frankly, I find myself in the awkward position of commending the legislature this year. Um, that's all I'm going to say. I commend the legislature, and it's an unusual 
place well, for I, me to be. You know, I, I can say I went into this um, fairly jaded about the process. And um, it, it was an interesting process because as I sat through it, the Lieutenant Governor's Chief of Staff, Nat Forstner, was heading up this group. And the questions that were asked were always the right questions. It was always, what should the policy be? What makes sense? And how do we then implement that the best? Um, what's going to be easiest for local governments? What's going to be easiest for businesses? It was a very straightforward kind of conversation. Now, it got convoluted because of all the complexity of the issues. Um, but they were good questions, and um, it, it was just nice to see folks from Treasury, from the Lieutenant Governor's Office, from Michigan Manufacturers Association, and from other groups working together to problem solve in a way that wasn't politically acerbic and, and was cooperative. Well, thank you, Scott. And I would say I probably was one of those jaded folks also. And it's good to see that our state government finally gets it when it comes to the, the financial situation that local communities are in. So thank you. Anybody else have questions for Scott? 